Welcome to Parasitic Diseases. Today we're going to discuss the pork tapeworm, known as Tinea solium. I'll begin with a little artistic <laughs> interlude. <laughs> this is a uh, very famous pa painting by uh, Paul Gauguin, and it's called Still Life with Ham. Notice it's not just called Still Life. <laughs> and I've, of course, added my own interpretation of what I think the title means. Because as you see here, depicted by Paul, is a very, very interesting piece of pork. Uh, and we know that pork is a rather lean meat. All the fat is found on the outside of most of the pork products that are, are derived from pigs. The inside meat is nice and, in this case, depicted as medium rare. So let the buyer beware, and we'll see what happens if one were to have ingested this piece of pork uh, say, from an area of the world in which uh, Tinea solium is common. And that's shown here. So the World Health Organization has identified the endemicity of Tinea solium, and it's essentially worldwide in distribution, but it's also associated with poor sanitary conditions. So it's not just the fact that we eat pork, because the United States raises a lot of pork. We have almost no um, autochthonous transmission of Tinea solium from pork products that are raised within the United States itself, or in Canada for that matter. Almost all of the cases that we see uh, in the clinics in the United States are imported cases from areas like Mexico, South America, Africa, uh, China, throughout the uh, Indonesian uh, archipelago. Now, the history of the discovery of this parasite is a little bit different than the one for Tinea saginata, and it involves two discoveries. One, uh, in the 1600s, by Hartman, who noticed that much of the pork that was being consumed locally had these little white flecks in them. And with a hand lens, he was actually able to see some kinds of structures inside, but had no idea of what he was looking at. Some 200 years later, in 1861, Kuchenmeister in Germany decided to find out what these little white flecks actually were. Now, the story is rather macabre, but I will give you the, uh, the essentials of what Kuchenmeister became famous for. Um, he surmised that tapeworms were derived from eating contaminated pork. He was fairly sure that the stage that resulted in the adult tapeworm came from these little white flecks in the meat. And in order to confirm that, he um, did the following experiment, and I'm using quotes here because it's probable that those experiments could never be done again. Uh, what he did was he went to the local jail and he determined that there was a prisoner who was due for execution about a month and a half uh, from the time he visited the prison. And he got permission from the um, authorities and from the prisoner himself to do the following. He obtained some pork with the little white flecks in them, and every week he fed a little bit of it to the prisoner. And then a month and a half later, of course, the prisoner was executed. And then Kuchenmeister dissected the gut tract of the prisoner and was able to line up the size of the worms, which resulted from eating those little white flecks, and correlated them with each week in which he fed them to the prisoner. So the longest ones were the ones he fed first, the next longest were the ones he fed the next week, the next week, and the next week. And so as you can see, he's <coughs> his portrait here... Um, is reminiscent of another one I've seen uh, from a well-known play that a lot of you might be familiar with. Uh, the, the play is Sweeney Todd. So I, I realize that there's some um, dark humor associated with all this also. But at any rate, Kuchenmeister proved once and for all that these little white flecks were indeed cystocerci, and the cystocerci resulted in adult tapeworms. And so here's the adult tapeworm. Again, the scolex of this worm is rather small, as shown here by the white arrow. And all of this worm was generated 
from this one little neck region over a three to four month period. The scolex of Tinea solium is a little bit different than that of Tinea saginata. We have four suckers, just like Tinea saginata, but in addition to that, we have what's called a rustellum with hooks. So this worm can really grab onto the host. Now, whether this worm actually grabs on and, and does the behavior that I described before as the meal passes down the small intestine, does the parasite then release and go follow the rest of the meal until it reaches a certain point, of physiological disturbance and then migrate right back up to where it was before to wait for the next meal, or does it just stay put? We don't know the answer to that. Here's an example of a gravid proglottid for Tania solium. It's got a very different morphology than the gravid proglottids for Tania saginata, and indeed, uh, this is the way in which you make the diagnosis between those two tapeworms. Again, the egg, however, cannot be distinguished, so that's the same picture that I showed before for Tinea saginata, I feel comfortable doing that because I know that even if I had eggs from these two different proglottids and put them together, you wouldn't be able to tell them apart. Now, the life cycle of Tinea solium is very, very similar to the life cycle of Tinea saginata in terms of the overall scheme. It begins with us ingesting a portion of infected pork which contain these larval stages called cystocerci. So each cystocercus has the potential for developing into an adult tapeworm after being ingested by a human host. The meat is digested in the stomach, releasing these larvae. The larva then goes to the small intestine. The scolex evaginates from this larval stage and immediately attaches to the small intestinal wall using its hooklets and suckers to do so and in three or four months generates the entire length of the worm. And if I didn't tell you that this was Tinea saginata, which I have already done, and instead I tell you that it's Tinea solium, you wouldn't be able to tell it apart from a gross specimen as what you see here. Both worms look similar. Both worms achieve approximately 20 to 25 feet in the host if allowed to go without being treated. And so they're both very large worms indeed. The gravid proglottids break off and they contaminate the pig's environment through human feces. And because animal husbandry with pigs is much more common throughout the world than animal husbandry for cattle, which require far more space, cattle are um, a rather challenging animal to raise for food, whereas pigs will actually live off the scraps of food that we create by our own uh, behavior so that we can raise pigs quite comfortably next to where we, all, where we also live. In many cultures, the pigs actually are considered part of the family, of course, with one major exception, and that is uh, what happens to the pig. Um, so the biology is, is straightforward. Uh, just to reiterate, the cystocircus is eaten develops to an adult, the adult produces gravid proglottids, the gravid proglottids are passed in the feces and contaminate the food of the pig, which then acquires the cystocerci throughout the tissue, and that reiterates the life cycle. This is a very common scene throughout the world. Here's a, just an up-close uh, picture of a piece of muscle tissue and the cystocercus inside. Just like Tinea saginata, the adult of Tinea solium causes no cellular or molecular pathogenesis. There is no uh, ill effects from harboring an adult tapeworm of either species. Same is true for clinical disease, but again, there may be some psychological effects of knowing that you harbor a 20-foot worm inside your gut tract. And now Dr. Daniel Griffin is going to give a clinical vignette illustrating the pathogenesis of this infection. We have an 18-year-old Islamic college student living in the student dormitories at a school in the Tamil Nadu region of southern India. He's eating most of his meals in the dormitory. These meals are prepared by a Hindu local couple that lives in the dorm, sort of dorm parents, you could think of them. This college student reports that he has developed a lump in his right neck. This has developed over several months. He feels well. The lump is not painful. He's just concerned what could this possibly be. 
a little background on this individual. He was born in India, raised in a Muslim family. He's an observant Muslim, uh, praying multiple times per day, observing the traditions of his religion. Um, now, on exam, he has a two centimeter firm, non-tender lump that is, is in, I mean, I clearly felt this, in the anterior portion of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. All right, let's talk a little bit about clinical disease. Um, gastrointestinal infection with adults. So patients are usually asymptomatic and do not become aware of this infection until they discover the proglottids in the stool, right? So these are the adults in the intestine. Um, they might see the proglottids in the stool. They might notice it in the perianal skin, the clothing, the bed sheets. Um, some patients, not many, will report a degree of abdominal pain, distension, diarrhea, nausea. Um, but these symptoms may be due to other causes. So whenever a patient presents and we have the diagnosis of teneosolium, we want to be a little wary, are the symptoms due to some other cause? Another clinical manifestation is invasive disease with juveniles. Um, and this is two major clinical presentations. And these are the presentations that we as clinicians worry most about. There can be extraneural, so it can be um, in the subcutaneous tissue, it can be in the muscles, so this is extraneural cystocercosis, or it can actually be in the, um, in the nervous system, so we call neurocystocercosis. The invasive disease is discussed a little further um, in the lecture on infection with juvenile tapeworms, just to make a note there. Now let's talk about diagnosis. Uh, microscopy. If you look under the microscope, this is very similar to tenia saginata. Uh, you can actually see gravid proglottids. You can inject them with India ink, or you can stain them with hematoxyl and eosin. And you can actually see um, branches on either side of, of the uterine branches. So uh, the T. psyllium has less than 12, so less branches on either side of the uterus than you might see with um, saginata. The eggs as well. The eggs can also be found in the stool. Um, or they might be right around the anus. Um, so you can find them either way. Now the distinction here, visually under the microscope, they look the same, except the T. solium eggs are not acid fast. They don't have an acid fast shell. So if you do acid fast staining, there's a distinction here to be made. Um, so there's a slight difference, even though you can't visually see it. Um, as mentioned, um, the fact that there are some on the anus, the paddle test or sticky tape test, um, can actually apply this to the perianal area, and uh, there may be some eggs that remain there and can be obtained and evaluated uh, microscopically. There are multiplex uh, nucleic acid amplification uh, screening tests that are available. These have high sensitivities, and they actually can make a distinction between the T. solium and the T. saginata. Um, there also are directed PCR as well as um, loop-mediated isothermal amplification tests. Um, there also is an ELISA test, and this can allow you to uh, distinguish antigens. So you can detect t saginata antigens or t solium antigens, coproantigens. Um, as far as diagnostic tests here, just to run through, it's very similar to what we did with t saginata. You can find the eggs. You can count the uterine branches on each side, less than 12. You can do our paddle test. We can do our thermocycler, so our nucleic and acid amplification testing, or we can look for the specific antigens in the stool. What about treatment? So again, this is gonna be, um, if we're looking at intestinal disease, we want an aluminal agent, so praziquantel can be given in a single dose. We also have the option here, particularly if we're worried about invasive disease, of adding albendazole uh, with or without praziquantel. And depending on the location, uh, steroids are sometimes added to treat the degree of inflammation that we might see. The drug of choice we see here, praziquantel, uh, with a mode of action where it interferes with the invertebrate calcium ion channels. What about our patient? Now, interesting enough, our patient um, had this lesion and it was in the, in the muscle. And when we did an ultrasound, we saw that this was a cyst and it had a small central density that was extending out from one of the walls. Um, this was diagnosed as um, extraneural cystocercosis. Uh, the patient had brain imaging prior to treatment to make sure that there wasn't gonna be um, any sort of response in the brain to inflammation. Um, they went ahead and they tested the Hindu couple. And so the Hindu couple was tested. One of them was found to have intestinal Tinea solium. 
Uh, so the person with the intestinal tenia solia was treated with praziquantel, so that's your gastrointestinal infection. And the concern is that somehow eggs from this individual got into the food that that um, college student was eating. The student was actually treated with praziquantel and albendazole after the brain imaging showed no lesions. So the praziquantel albendazole here is not going to be focused on just luminal disease, but it's going to actually um, do well at penetrating. Um, and this, this individual did quite well. Let's talk about prevention and control. Preventing and controlling infection with tinea saginata and tinea solium is the same. Disposal, proper disposal of feces by a modern uh, treatment facility or a not so modern um, outhouse is equally effective in controlling the spread of this disease. Again, we can also practice good sanitary practices on pig farms and in most areas of the um, more developed world, let's say throughout Europe and the United States, Canada, some portions of, of other countries as well. Um, human feces could never come in contact with pig food and therefore the pigs could not acquire this infection. But in other situations, of course, where the intimacy of people living next to their pigs is high, then obviously there, there is the chance for pigs eating the eggs, the eggs hatching in the small intestine of the pig, the larva inside the egg then migrates into the blood of the pig and is distributed throughout the body, establishing cystocerci wherever they stop their migration. An example of that meat is shown here. Each one of these is a cystocercus that resulted from the ingestion of multiple eggs. And remember, each one of these gratified proglottids contain, contains over a thousand eggs each. And as a result, uh, there could be many cystocerci in the tissue of an animal, even if it only ate one proglottid. Federal meat inspection also stops the infection at that point by identifying animals that are infected and discarding them, thereby, thereby preventing the meat from reaching consumers. The reason why we're pausing here is that I want to back up a moment and just discuss what would happen if a person were to eat an egg of tinea saginata. <clears throat> what would be the consequences? And the answer is, there wouldn't be any. And there's a good reason for that. And that is that this tapeworm has evolved to become the parasite of both humans and cattle. And cattle have a different arrangement to their digestive tract than we do. And as a result, the environmental cues that stimulates the egg of Tinea saginata to hatch is given off by passage through these three stomachs of the cow. They don't hatch until they've gone through all three. However, if you ingest the egg of Tinea solium, that egg will hatch in our small intestines as it does in the small intestine of the pig. Because I know this might be upsetting to some of you to learn that there is very little difference between the digestive tract of a pig and the digestive tract of a human. In fact, it's so similar that the egg of Tinea saginata can tell the difference, but the egg of Tinea solium cannot. The egg of Tinea saginata will not infect pigs. So that is, those, that's the difference. So what is the consequence? What is the clinical consequence of humans being exposed to the eggs of Tinea solium? What happens next? So the next time we're going to discuss juvenile tapeworm infections, some of these have very serious medical consequences. Thank you for listening.